Good evening, and thank you for joining us for our four evenings discussion. My name is Maya Konitzer, and I'm with the Global Studies Center at the University of Pittsburgh. This discussion is scheduled in partnership with Pittsburgh Arts and Lectures 10 evening series. And we would like to extend our thanks for their continuing support. These uh, specific pre-lecture discussions scheduled prior to the author events with Pittsburgh Arts and Lectures provide additional insight on prominent writers and engaging global issues. And tonight we will be discussing the work of Ocean Vong, On Earth We Are Briefly Gorgeous. I'm delighted to welcome all of you and to introduce our guests and speakers, Michael Goodhart and Mike Coy, who will lead tonight's discussion. First, Michael Goodhart is a professor in the Department of Political Science and director of the Global Studies Center. His work focuses on democracy, human rights, and injustice in a context of globalization. Michael has written wildly on these topics. And our second um, guest tonight is Mai Khoi. Mai Khoi is an award-winning Vietnamese singer, composer, and activist. Her compositions and vocal performance represent the meeting of diverse musical traditions, such as Western and non-Western, acoustic and electroacoustic, and so on, and confound listener expectations with experimental and at times highly improvised arrangements. In 2010, Mai Khoi rose to stardom after winning Vietnam's most prestigious award for songwriting. As a pop star, Khoi released seven albums in genre of Vietnamese pop and dance and made regular nationally televised performances. At the height of her fame, her engagement with activism brought her into conflict with Vietnam's authoritarian government and transformed her artistic practice. Her artistic transformation is evident in Mai Khoi Chem Zha, a genre-splicing genre dissident trio she founded in 2016 that combines protest music with free jazz and lost musical traditions of Vietnam's hill tribes. She then went on to participate in Symphony, a project that aims to create the first pan-Southeast Asian orchestra comprised of ethnic minority musicians as a conductor, arranger, and composer. In recognition of her work at the intersection of art and activism, Maikoy was awarded the Václav Havel Prize for Creative Descent. In 2019-20, Maikoy was artist in residence at Shim, New York City. She is now Artist Protection Fund Fellow at the Global Studies Center at the University of Pittsburgh. In the United States, Maikoy has performed at Joe's Pub, National Sawdust, and Lincoln Center. So we will begin with our first presenter, Dr. Goodhart. The stage is yours. Great, thank you so much, Maya. It's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to um, be presenting to you tonight along with, uh, along with Koi. I'm really glad that she agreed to, to join us for this. I think she'll be able to provide a, a perspective that we would otherwise have, have missed out on on this really interesting book. Um, I hope people have, have read the book. If not, um, spoiler alert, I'm going to say some things about what's going to happen. So if you haven't read the book and you're planning to and you don't want to spoil it, you might, uh, well, do what you need to do. Um, this being a global studies um, book club and not just a fun book club, um, not, notice I said not just a fun book club. It is fun, but it's not just fun. Um, it's also educational. And so I just want to share with you a little bit of context about the book um, that I hope highlights some of the um, global themes and connections um, that are relevant here that you might not have um, that you might not have thought about otherwise. So uh, let's see. Um, again, this global perspective is one that isn't really foregrounded in the novel, um, but one that I think uh, can really enrich our understanding of. Um, of the setting in particular, and of uh, some of the events that happen uh, to the main characters. So without ado, let me just um, mention the three contexts that I'm going to try to elaborate on a little bit tonight. Uh, the first being the Vietnam War, uh, the second being economic stagflation in the 1970s, which 
may not seem relevant, but I promise will be. And then the third, um, the neoliberal restructuring of the US economy that took place partly as a result of that economic stagflation. And I promise this will uh, make sense in terms of the novel very quickly. So the setting of the novel itself is the late 1990s into the 2000s in Hartford, Connecticut. And so um, you see a picture of Hartford uh, below, and obviously uh, many of you will remember President Bill Clinton. And you see in the background the NAFTA yes sign with the check mark. But we'll be talking a bit more about that in just a second. So, so we're in the late 90s and the 2000s in Hartford, Connecticut. So the first thing to say is about the Vietnam War itself. <clears throat> this is the sort of context that underlies the book and which does make periodic, um, you know direct occurrences. Um, the first thing to note is that Little Dog's grandfather uh, was, a US, was a US soldier. I put grandfather here in quotes for reasons that those of you who have read the book will understand. Um, but it's estimated that between 25,000 and 30,000 children uh, were born of US soldiers with Vietnamese mothers during the 10 years uh, when the US was most active um, in the Vietnam conflict from 65 to 75. So 25 to 30,000 um, children. Uh, there were really two waves of migration from Vietnam to the US. Uh, the first took place immediately following the US withdrawal uh, when a lot of allied um, families, families of, of soldiers, South uh, Vietnamese government officials and so on uh, left and came to the United States. So there was a big wave in the sort of mid 1970s of, uh, of people uh, from Vietnam resettling in the US. But uh, a second large wave uh, of people came um, <clears throat> following what was called the American Homecoming Act in 1988. Um, this was structured alongside something called the Orderly Departure Program. Uh, the US managed to work out with the Vietnamese government with which it did not have diplomatic relations at the time, a program that would help to regularize and make safer, uh, more orderly as the name suggests, um, the continued migration of people uh, out of Vietnam to not just the US but other countries around the world. And it's estimated that around 11,000 additional um, migrants and refugees came to the US uh, as a result of, of this second um, big resettlement project in the late 1980s. It's never indicated in the novel, um, and I don't know enough about um, the author's biography to know, but I wouldn't be surprised based on the way um, we piece events together if, uh, if his family might not have come to the US um, as part of that program. And the second bit of context I wanted to mention for you also from the 1970s is uh, what was known as stagflation. For those of you of a certain age, you'll recognize scenes like that one on the right. Those were actually the cars we were driving around in at that time, for those of you younger folks in the audience. Um, and there was a gas, um, an, a gas shortage related to the OPEC oil shock. Um, that, along with massive US deficit spending, caused this period of high inflation and economic recession that came to be known as stagflation. So that's really important because while the oil shocks were an important contributor to that stagflation, so was massive US deficit spending that was going on at the time. And that deficit spending came from two sources, um, both of which are relevant to the story. Uh, the first being uh, spending on the war uh, in Vietnam and the second being spending on the so-called great society programs, right? The expansion of Medicare, the introduction of Medicaid, the anti-poverty programs, the urban redevelopment programs of the Johnson administration. So all that was being done at a time when taxes were not being raised. And so there was a lot of deficit spending uh, happening, which contributed to this high inflation uh, along with um, no economic growth or even sometimes negative economic growth or uh, typically uh, an atypical situation um, in terms of macroeconomics. What this led to uh, was the economic restructuring of the United States. So um, the term we use in global studies to describe this period that begins in the uh, late 70s, early 1980s is uh, neoliberalism for uh, those of you who, for whom that term uh, is foreign. 
You'll remember uh, Ronald Reagan's Morning in America campaign. He was going to transform the way uh, the US economy and society worked. So there were going to be tax cuts. There was going to be deregulation. There was going to be union busting. And I should have put a fourth bullet point. There was going to be a, a massive reduction in government spending. So uh, we began to see cutbacks in those kinds of welfare programs, that social safety net that had been in place uh, increasingly from the 30s through the 60s. We began to see uh, <clears throat> a more unfettered marketplace allowing uh, greater competition and the logic of the market to, to reign and the weakening of um, trade and labor organizations and the kind of protections that they had brought for workers. Fast forward to the 1992 campaign, really sort of the end of the, of the Reagan era because uh, George Bush, uh, George H.W. Bush really continued most of Reagan's policies. So we get into the early 90s. This is the period when Little Dog would have been um, just a very small child. Um, when Bill Clinton runs in 1992, uh, after he's elected, he does two big things. Um, both of which contribute to this idea that the era of big government is over. This was the famous Clinton triangulation, right? We're gonna be like, we're gonna be like the Republicans enough to attract swing voters, but we're also gonna maintain a distinctive democratic position. Clinton embraced free trade and he announced the end of welfare as we know it. So uh, <clears throat> for the context of this story, that means NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, and that means the end of uh, the kinds of welfare uh, support programs that would have helped families like Little Dogs uh, had they still been in existence. Programs like uh, aid to families with dependent uh, children, the kinds of programs that were dramatically cut back or that had work requirements added to them um, under the Clinton regime. Why is this relevant? Well, Morning in America didn't translate into Morning in Hartford, Connecticut. Hartford was and remains among the poorest big cities in America. Over 30% of the population uh, lives below the federal poverty line. As uh, many of you may know, the federal poverty line is uh, itself a very conservative um, estimate of poverty. Uh, you can be above the poverty line and still in a very bad way. Hartford suffered from severe and early urban decline. Uh, the, the white flight story that is typical of big cities around the US uh, was was um, the same in, in Hartford. In fact, it happened in Hartford earlier than many places. If those of uh, you who drive to New England uh, may know, Hartford lies at the intersection of a bunch of major interstate highways. Um, those highways enabled a lot of people to move out of town and continue to work downtown in the insurance industry. Um, <clears throat> and so white flight was a, was a, was a problem uh, early uh, and severely in Hartford. Free trade led to uh, a loss of manufacturing jobs in central Connecticut. You may remember Ross Perot criticizing that giant sucking sound of jobs going south of the border as a result of NAFTA. If you look at the chart here on the right, you see change in US manufacturing employment from 1970 to 2010, and the really precipitous drop um, beginning right after NAFTA comes into effect in, in the mid 1990s, right? So that from uh, it's a little hard to see those numbers there, but from 2000 to 2010, uh, you see a loss of <clears throat> something on the order of 40,000 jobs. And those are only direct uh, employment in manufacturing. Like I don't need to tell this story to people in, in Pittsburgh, you've lived through a version of this, um, but there's a precipitous decline in manufacturing. employment. So all of those things, plus the fact that there's a large migrant workforce, uh, migrant farm workers who obviously figure into the story in an important way, um, but a large number of migrant farm workers who, um, who are relatively precarious, who typically don't own homes and so on, um, help to contribute to an environment uh, in Hartford that, um, that is the one that Little Dog uh, inhabits, which is a fairly desolate, hollowed out urban core uh, with serious drug problems and a lot of poverty. So I've named, uh, in an attempt to be ironic here, fixing the problem um, Connecticut is among the top five overdose states in the U.S. Uh, for opioid uh, overdoses. You see here on the left, the average rate per 100,000 population of emergency room visits um, for overdose-related symptoms. And you see that Hartford uh, 
with a rate of uh, 30.15 per 100,000 population has the highest rate in Connecticut, which again is one of the top five states in the country. So the opioid epidemic, a very, very serious problem across Hartford uh, and across Connecticut. There were over a thousand accidental intoxication deaths in 2018. 948 of those uh, involved opioids. So um, my screen is hung up. Okay, so, so what does all this have to do with, um, with the novel and the war? Well, um, the point I hope that I've showed you very quickly, and they only gave me a few minutes to, to speak, which you're probably all glad of. Um, the, the point I'm trying to make here is that, you know, these things are not unrelated, right? The, um, the high concentration of immigrants in a, in a city that was otherwise hollowed out by white flight and urban decay because of the population uh, of, the, of the policies that were implemented um, in the 80s and 90s in a bipartisan fashion um, to sort of uh, transform the economy, to end welfare, to deregulate, um, to cut back that social safety net. Uh, those are the same policies that led to the loss of jobs, the insecurity, the high crime, and the kind of despair that has driven the opioid epidemic um, to be what it is. And so those are some of the pieces of background uh, that I think, you know, again, they don't figure directly into the story, but they're important for helping us to understand um, some of the backdrop um, you know, some of the, the, the world in which Little Dog um, lives. So what I want to do now is turn things over to Mai Khoi um, to have her speak a little bit about um, what the Vietnam War looked like from the perspective of folks um, in Vietnam, right? The people who didn't leave afterwards, the folks who um, stayed behind to build a new country after the U.S. Uh, ceased its two decades of aggression against Vietnam in the early 70s. And so, um, you know, the war, which in Vietnam is typically known as the resistance war against America or just the American war, uh, is something that she can give us uh, a unique perspective on. So I'm going to turn it over to her. Thank you, Michael. Um, actually, today I just want to say a few things about Ocean Blue's book on Earth, We Briefly Gorgeous, that resonate with my own lived experience. Um, Ocean Blue says he is a direct product of the war. I am also a product of the war. His family and my family, we were in the losing side of the war because, because we were from the south of Vietnam. We were born after the war, but we grew up in its shadow. His family was forced to leave after the war while my family stayed. Although now, 46 years after the war finished, I have been forced to leave my country because my activism, that is also a product of the war. Because if America had not invaded Vietnam, then everything would be very different now. At least we would not have the colonial mentality like now. In the book, Ocean Boom experienced the anxiety of the war through his family because he grew up with his grandmother who suffered trauma from the war. I experienced anxiety of not have enough food to eat. I didn't have milk to drink either because the country had been destroyed by the war and because the U.S. trade embargo on Vietnam after the war. Ocean Boom's mother never learned to read because the war interrupted her education. She had problems communicating with her son and instead used violence. And my father, he had to go to the re-education camp, a kind of jail. Picture one, please, Maya. Picture one is uh, the, first, the first one the re-education camp picture 
this is the last one. The, the picture one was down down here. Who is the last one? So you, yeah. Yes, this picture is the image of the re-education camp after the war in Vietnam that my father went to. He went there for a year. Our family was discriminated against by the government because we were on the losing side. The government confiscated all of the citizens' property. People who didn't go to the re-education camp were forced to go to the wilderness area for the new economy policy where they were forced to work without payment. And this play was also kind of chill because they didn't allow people to go out of that area. Now the government still used that re-education camp to chill sex worker and force them to work without payment as well. I think they are kind of a product of the war. Picture two, please. Yes, so this is the re-education can look like now. Vietnam had never had freedom of expression. I remember in my house, my family had to whisper because they scared the neighbors could report what they say to the police. And my friend's father went to jail for 10 years for singing love songs in his house. Even now, I have been banned from singing in public because my songs are about human rights and politics. I can't even organize the show a show in my own house without asking for the government permission. Picture three, please. This is when the police raided my concerts in my private studio. Yeah, I think the way two governments, Vietnam and the US handled the consequences of the war were so bad. It increased hatred, division, and hurts. There's a lot of people. And the fate of hybrid children like Ocean Boom's mother and the people infected with Agent Orange after the war were even more tragic. They were pushed out of the society were discriminated just because their fathers were the American soldiers, the enemies of Vietnam. Picture four, please. This is a picture, very famous picture of uh, the hybrid children. Their life were very difficult and poor until 1987, when the Amerasian Homecoming Act was enforced. Most of them were volunteered to go to the US, but some of them still stay in Vietnam, poor and lack education until now, because the errors of the paperwork. And the people with the Agent Orange gave birth to children like this. Picture five and six, please. A million of people and children are having Agent Orange affected like this until now. They are also products of the war. Ocean Boom grow up as a victim of domestic violence because the way his family handled the drama of the war. He said, 
the poison of the war entered them. They passed it down to me. I was also a victim of domestic violence from the men in my family because the patriarchy society of Vietnam after the war. I see this is a result of the militarization to the society. After the war, my father, like most of the men in Vietnam, they didn't have work. They couldn't earn the living for the family. It affected the identity of men. They couldn't fulfill their role as a breadwinner. So they drank a lot and expressed their dress violently. Because we are products of the war, this experience shape how we create art. We are using art to empower and promote social change. Our art is the association of folklore and trauma. Ocean Vuong using his story and his imagination to tend to himself and to empower, to celebrate the beauty of the working class people, black, brown, and yellow and LGBT people. I'm doing the same thing with my music. During Artist Protection Fund Fellowship at Pittsburgh University, I am making the musical project called Bad Activist. And this project, I am also telling my own story to explore social justice issues. 46 years after the war finished, Vietnam economy is developing very fast now. You can see many beautiful pictures more than these pictures. And if you are a tourist, you will, you will be happy to be there in Vietnam. <laughs> and many people have a better life now than before. Even my family, yeah, we have enough food to eat now. <laughs> But the development of the country is uneven. There are many billionaires, but there are still many people living poor and many children don't have enough food to eat and don't have milk to drink now. And Vietnam still not have freedom of expression or freedom of assembly for artists' freedom. Many products of the war are still there. Thank for having me to, <laughs> to tell my own experience through this book's event. Thank you, Mykoi. Thank you, Michael. Um, we have some uh, questions that were um, designed before this, and I will now move people into breakout rooms, and the questions will be shared with you once you're in the breakout room. So we will spend, um, it's 6.30, maybe about 10 minutes in the breakout room, so we'll call you back at about 6.42.